Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You see in the back of our bulletin, we have a few upcoming events. This month, it will be on a Wednesday, March 20th. Uh, an active church of the Brethren Pastor will speak to us on what does an alternative church look like. No building, uh, no formal things, hymnals, and, and things like uh, traditional churches enjoy yet fully brethren and fully reaching out into the college age and young adult group. Then we have our First Lady sharing luncheon. April 9 seems so far away, doesn't it? Oh, oh, oh. And, really, coming up Friday, Saturday evening, uh, Moeller Spiritual Renewal Services. Each one, I would mention, um, has food attached to it as well. <laughs> but what a lovely e what a lovely event it will be and close by. Any other announcements? All right, then we'll quiet our hearts for the prayer. <laughs> today you've given us a warm and sunny day unlike we've had since the middle of last November. Each day is a new and gracious beginning by you. Your plans for us are good and hopeful. We have gathered to worship, to pray, to fellowship, to open our hearts to hear from you, to find strength and grace in you for the living of these days. That is our prayer for these moments together. <coughs> In Jesus' name, amen. And our praise team will be leading us in singing. Hear that song? Brother, we have come to worship. <laughs> I can't keep my mouth shut. I got a hum with it. That's it just me. So, anyway, new song. I don't think we sang it before. Amazing Grace. Most of you know most of it. There'll be some little bit difference in the middle. You'll follow along with it. Anyway. Okay.
Amazing grace. Amen. Amen. The next one here, Knowing You, I think we sang this before, so...
Bye. We're on. We're on. You see in the bulletin, pastor's announcement of retirement. I hope all of you got the letter from Doug and myself, but I don't assume you all did. Did any of you not get a letter? Sue, did you? Okay, I see. Uh, the mail today, you can't assume much. That's why I thought I'd read my letter to you, have a few moments for comments, and then assure you my sermon will be on this topic, and then we can talk downstairs over snacks. Dear East Cocalico Church of the Brethren family, it is with mixed emotions that I wish to announce my retirement date from full-time pastoral ministry. My decision comes after much prayer and consideration. I've had some of the best years of my life with you. I hope you have learned half as much from me as I have learned from you. We have cried and laughed together. We have worshiped and worked together. You are very valuable to me. Over these next months, it's my plan to offer as much ministry experiences to you as I can. Over the past seven years, we have grown in Christ and in faith together. I will add, I've learned more than about professional truck driving than they ever thought I'd know. <laughs> um, we have experienced joy, sorrow, challenges, and victories. I'm deeply grateful for the love and support you have shown me. The memories we have built will forever hold a special place in my heart. Uh, this is an addition. For a long time of my life, I was pastor at a church where they forbid me to go to uh, the nation of Israel on the spiritual pilgrimage. I could go as a protester against Israel. And so I never went. And when I came here, uh, it seems like a third of you have already been there. Uh, what a gift to me. That's how, that's how much theology does matter. Now all of us are in a season of change. Change is never easy, it's hard work. I think of Jeremiah 29, 11, which says to us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I, any thoughts or comments? I will be downstairs after this. You're making it easy for me. Because today is not easy for any of us, is it? No. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. This thing of endings is a tough deal. I'm going to stay right here and do our joys and concerns, after which Praise Team is going to sing. Joys and concerns. We certainly want to pray, and I mean this, for all of our families, including mine. <coughs> families break and have breaking points and issues. We want to talk, pray for broken churches. This is a goodbye and a breaking point, hopefully a separation for some of us. We want to remember Pat Keller. We want to remember Eve's sister, Barb, and her husband, Raymond, who have such serious health issues. We want to remember Raymond Miller, who's here, and uh, like many of us, have health issues that creep up and, and kind of are hard to track down and stabilize. Any other prayer concerns? Boy. Can I use the microphone? Yeah. I'd just like to give an update on uh, Joe after feeding. I didn't talk to him really ahead of time here. I wish I would have, but I didn't have a chance to. But the, the update of Joe after is exactly the same as it was last year this time. For those of you that don't know, Joe had a stroke in January of 23. 
And since then, he's been bedridden, occasionally gets into the wheelchair. But <clears throat> Joe needs our prayers. In addition to Joe, uh, Joe's wife, Bree, she also needs our prayers. She has her daily struggles and issues with Joe. She has her own health concerns, struggles. And on top of all of that, she's maintaining the household. So, Reedy also needs our prayers. <clears throat> we need to pray for Joe and Reedy for uh, comfort, peace of mind, healing, and, and a uh, <clears throat> miracle. Joe needs a miracle. And I would like everybody in the congregation to pray their own prayer in silence for Joe, healing, uh, healing and comfort and peace of mind and a miracle. So if the congregation would pray silently for 20 seconds, you would bow your heads.
we turn to a very familiar and often quoted passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's easy to be trite about such a passage or consider it fluff, but the opposite is actually true. And Solomon wrote, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And this passage comes from what we call the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. These are gentle truths and they are hard truths written in memorable ways. But they remind all of us that there will be a time for everything in our lives and that these difficult times will come to all of us in their seasons I really don't like saying goodbye. It's one of the worst feelings I know. Did you know what goodbye means? It's good, and then the letters be why. God bless you. That's what goodbye actually means. Saying goodbye has an empty and uncertain feeling to me. Because we will not always be together. And we're not guaranteed that we'll see each other again. In this text, I say, which is much more serious than at first glance, he lists the raw realities of the passing of our days. The reality of birth and death. The reality of weeping and laughing the reality of searching and giving up the search, the reality of keeping something, and most all of us in this room are in the second part, of figuring out how to get rid of stuff, which is harder than getting it. These are hard choices we must make and we will make. If we procrastinate, or not make a choice, that is a clear and powerful choice. Only that kind of passive way hurts people a lot more, because they have to spend a lot more energy waiting and wondering. The saying is, we make our choices, then our choices make us. I do not take this passage lightly at all. It is a manifest for living an authentic life and facing all the issues that almost bombard us. About 10 years ago, right around this time, my lead pastor, Bob Kettering, handed me a book and said, here, with a smile, your turn next. Oh. He had just announced his retirement. Now, he's worked part-time since. 
I felt a little sad and empty taking the book. And I looked at it. The title of the book is Necessary Endings. The author is Dr. Henry Cloud. He is a Christian counselor, leader, educator, and thank goodness his life has stayed far above and away from all controversy and drama. Uh, and because he, uh, he takes biblical truths and makes them understandable, this blows my mind, he's a New York Times bestseller, this devout Christian therapist, and a Wall Street bestseller. If you're in my Sunday school class, you have listened to hours and hours of <laughs> Dr. Henry Cloud in the church. His most recognizable work to me is called boundaries. When to say yes, when to say no, and how to take control of your life. All so easy to say, isn't it? But we do this every day. We draw boundaries, say yes, say no, and get control of our life. To me, even more shocking, but it shouldn't be. Because God's hand is on him. His most popular book on Wall Street for small and large business owners and leaders is entitled Integrity. The Courage to Meet the Demands of Reality. I was always told, Steve, a leader's first job is to define reality as horrible as that may be. This specific book, Necessary Endings, challenges every Christian to lean into the realities of their life and situation, no matter what they are. And he says, endings are not a tragedy to be feared and later regretted. He said, recognize that we must recognize that necessary endings in our lives are the best way that God can lead us to let go of things whose time has passed. Man, is that hard. In this message, I'm going to share many of his thoughts. I'm not going to list the 20 pages of citations for everything you could, of biblicals, because we'd be here at 1 o'clock, and I'd certainly be facing an ending then. He has the, he just takes a scripture verse and then writes about the reality. This is so painful, and I have to, I always start with this guy. He writes, many people waste their lives doing unsatisfactory things. And all of us have to interpret what it means. He says, many people waste their lives trying to fix unworkable relationships. He said, whenever you come, like we all together, and I'm training it as well as others, a necessary ending, God is going to light a spark to re-energize all of us and get us unstuck from something. He says, and, and I'm just saying, you know, this he doesn't quote scripture, so, because this really hurts, hurts me. He says, much of what we do is an unnecessary waste of time and energy. Ouch. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't quite get that, and we're going to move on. Uh, but I have to say it, to, not to challenge you, but to challenge this person. Necessary endings are the hardest part of the cycles of a human life. Whatever vision God gives you for your life, and God has a vision for this church and your life and my life this year, and it's unfolding. Necessary endings are the hardest part, but he says, and he quotes scripture, whatever vision God gives you and purpose for this year, just know, God will have to prune your life. Well, I'm getting nervous now. I'm surprised I'm not sweating. God has a new chapter for each of our lives. 
Oh. And to live our corporate new chapter, we all will have to end something and leave something behind. Boy, that's tough. That is so tough. He says, at times, the believer with the strength of Jesus must learn how to close doors and move on with your life. Necessary endings are the reason that you're not married to your prom date. Or, necessary endings are not the reason you're working your first job. Now, Jim Ross may be an example. Did you work one job all your life? Okay, he said no. You know, so necessary endings, um, I remember what mine was, um, and I won't tell you, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> Moving on, he has a whole chapter. Why in the world do all of us, starting with me, resist necessary endings? And he gives like four, four little reasons. He says, number one, we all have had painful endings, and we sure don't want to go through another one. That, that's the human. Well, try it, Steve. They hurt. Number two, he says, <coughs> we probably haven't learned everything we needed to from prior endings, so we are repeating our mistakes, and thus don't have the strength to face it again. Three, he says, we have chosen not to develop the difficult skills to work through endings. I understand that. And fourth and finally, he says, we resist necessary endings because we're afraid of the unknown. We don't know if it'll be better or worse. He says, please spend some time with God each day over a few weeks and ask God to put in your gut, you can say spirit or lungs, whatever, mind, thinking, but ask God to put in your gut what he's calling you to do. For example, and these are his, like dismount a dead horse. Mm -hmm. Say farewell to a sacred cow. Make a job change. When we do this, we are facing a necessary ending. He said something else, which is very hard for me. <clears throat> the wisest people with God's grace know when to quit something. You know, we tell you, kids, you can't quit. <laughs> You're taking piano lessons a year. I took piano lessons a year. It was pitiful, but I took them. I always say I took piano lessons at the end of a shotgun for a year. And that was it. I wanted a mini mic. And the rest is history. But wise people know, like, and for all of us, I, I've kept, I don't know, I haven't turned tokens, I've kept a journal for 35 years. You know what's scary? I can go back to like New Year's Day 10 years ago. I was doing the same thing when I did this New Year's Day. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I dare look at that. Do you know what I mean? I thought I'm creative and, yeah, I think deep down you get what I'm saying. It blows my mind. Wise people know when to quit. Or if we're going to have any growth, he says, we're going to have to quit something or we will stay stuck in it. Um, and we will never reach the purpose of our lives. And that purpose is all of us are building our character because God's going to say, okay, you, 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 you are going to judge the angels. You know, I, I, we're here to build uh, character. And the big secret is, Paul says, of, of the life to come, when he had a glimpse, he said, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to earth. And God said, yes, you are. He said, I don't want to. He, he says these discussions. God said, get. You're going back and continue to plant and establish the church. Another thing he says that, that just knocks me over. He says, and this is all of us, starting with me. When we get stuck in life, we go to the Bible and adjust the truth 
to what we want it to be saying. You think of that. Instead of going to the Bible and let the truth adjust us. Uh, I just appreciate his honesty. He's been so helpful in my life. God needs you to know that some of the people and me who we love are never going to change no matter what you and I do. And I'm like, I'm, and he's not telling us who, but there were some profound truths of life. And keep loving them. He says, failing well means if you can fail at something and accept it, and even and come to the point that you laugh at it, then God can move you on to something better. My dear sister Maureen, who's only a year older than me, a pastor's wife in Myerstown, said, Steve, and she's the same. She's a, a national quilt champion. She's ahead of, uh, she's retired just a year. And she, she said, she's part of a cooking team. I said, isn't that special? I envisioned six to eight 110 year old ladies, you know, and bottles of strong coffee. There are 80 people. They have a major budget. They travel the quilt national. So I'm just saying, she's an overachiever. I have no idea and how hobbies have become. She said, Steve, I'm going to tell you something. As you can enter your 60s and go on, make your project smaller. And I said, pray tell. She said, that way, if you fail at one, uh, you don't have to live with a big regret the rest of your life. I just, I, I have in her words, she can be very direct. And just pointing out, but failing well is the only way to move on. I told Betty, I'm making my project smaller. I have these electric race cars. I have a lot of them. They're gorgeous. So I thought, I'll, I'll buy old junkers and put bodies on, glue them together and paint them. And, you know, I'd still build them. I did one. It's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in this world. And I walked to Betty and said, there's a first. I built a car that's so ugly it should be driven over by a car. <laughs> that might not be in the car. So just say, just a small, humorous example. Oops. Not everything is going to go well. <coughs> Our challenge is when the truth presents itself to us, it, we must try to accept it as the light from God. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, Children of God, are we holding on to something that has already died? Are we birthing something that should never live? Are we laughing about something we should be weeping about? Are we embracing somebody we should stay away from? Are we searching for an answer when it's past time to find that answer? Because our own procrastination has made it a non-issue. <clears throat> loyalty is important, but every loyalty must have boundaries. Being loyal does not mean that you're responsible for someone else's decision, no matter how much you love them. Being loyal does not mean that you have to put up with any mistreatment. Godly wisdom, this is a big point of this, godly wisdom comes from life experience. And we can learn it either ourselves, which is uh, learning the hard way, or if we can, and this is a miracle if we can, Learn it from others. That's why I listened to my sister. She said, don't, you know, don't think you're going to build another car in your late 60s. <laughs> she said to me. Um, Dr. Clown says, please, as a believer in God, let wisdom do its work in your heart. We must receive lessons that our experience is trying to teach us. And God is calling all of us. I don't know what they are. On a bad day, I don't know what mine are. 
but he is calling us to make clear decisions with the information we have, which is always partial information. Like the decision of what you will not put up with. And that famous saying that's been drilled into me, you will get what you tolerate. Like the decision of what you will no longer do. So that you have new energy to do something better. That's very hard for a German like me to sort that out. I'm not going to do this. There's nothing wrong with it. I want a little energy to do something new for God. He said we'll have to give up something to move into a better place in our life. And then he says the Bible teaches clearly three things. Accept the cycles and seasons of your life. I told Betty recently I went to the McDonald's near effort of Walmart, and they went through, and all I wanted was a little pick-me-up coffee. It went in the afternoon, and I said, I want a small coffee. The girl on the other end, because I met her later, I think she was 80 pounds, her hair was, hair was pale blue, and she smiled and said to me, I think you want the senior coffee. <laughs> <laughs> senior coffee. Oh. <laughs> Except for seasons. We have dear friends, Beth and Tim. I won't tell you their last name. They live in Grand Rapids. Tim is naturally tall, slender, athletic, and has naturally dark hair and young features. They're in their middle 60s. His dear wife, Beth, is much shorter. She naturally has pure white hair. They told us they went out to like, like a bank or something to, to make a decision about finances, and as they were closing, uh, uh, I'll just say the banker. The banker said to Tim, I hope, I hope this was a good meeting, and he looked at his wife and said, and I hope your mother is happy with you too. <laughs> she said she cried for two days straight. <laughs> we all think we're the ones who remain 30. Until they people insist I get senior coffees. <clears throat> oh. But I, I love that we can laugh and face reality. Okay, this is what he says. And then, number one. <clears throat> accept the seasons and cycles of life. See? Second, he said. And this is, I've never heard this in my life. Or put this way. He says, accept that life, your life, produces too much life. Let me explain. To be human is to strive, is to push, is to think about more things. To be human is to put too, is to simply keep adding more to our lives until finally, and even, even adding more things we choose to fret about, until finally there's too much life in our life and it's not going good. And he said, so second, number first, accept the season of life. And it's going to continue. Second, accept you have way too much life going. Some things need to be ended. And third, accept that evil and death are a part of this life. These three principles will help us when our time has come to walk through our necessary endings. And I think the subtle part that my life takes on more and more life and more and more frets. We all say, I never worry. I'll call them frets then. I have a dear friend who owns a small business. And uh, his eyebrows fell out. Mustache fell out, his feet and hands went numb. Went to the doctor, There's, it, it's a clear syndrome. And they said, uh, worry is eating you up. But he said, I don't worry at all. I'm the happiest man alive. And, and, and trust me, that's, that's, be, that's between him and God and his doctor. But all I, all I can say to all of us, 
worry, pressure, heartbreak, depression, or slippery little mothers that weave their ways into all of the best of our lives with the best of our faith and dump too much life on us. And some of it just has to be given up, hard as that is. Finally today, if we live into these biblical truths, when the endings come to us, we'll be able to do what we need to do. It won't be easy. He said there will always be bleeding when you cut out a cancer. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, Great is the art of the beginning, but greater is the art of ending. I've never heard this. And dug it in his moderator's letter to you this past week. Said, do not, and Mr. Rogers said, do not think of it as an end, that you are at the beginning of something new. Greater is the art of ending than starting some little fluff thing and letting it go. And that's exactly where you and I are this morning. I want to close by reading the chapter preceding chapter 3, a few texts, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 22 to 26. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? I think we can all pause and say amen to that. <laughs> All their days, their work is grief and pain. He says, even at night, their minds don't rest. Now, this didn't happen to any of us, but we're sharing this so we can encourage others. He said, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their work. This is from the hand of God. For without God, who can eat and find enjoyment? To the person who pleases God, he will give wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the stubborn sinner, he gives the life task of gathering up wealth to hand it over to others when they die. Yes, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Today, all of us begin together the hard work of necessary endings for a better beginning. May God just breathe his love and help on all of us and fill us with life anew. And that's the opening verse of our closing hymn. Breathe on the breath of God. Fill me with life anew. Number 300.